It's time for Pure Performance. Get your stopwatches ready. It's time for Pure Performance with Andy Grabner and Brian Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Pure Performance. My name is Brian Wilson, and as always, I have my guest here with me, Andy. Not my guest, my co-host. Sorry, Andy. Uh, my co-host, Andy Grabner. I'm a little, yeah, I'm a little bit uh, not all there in my head today. Uh, anyway, Andy, how you doing? It's been a little while. I know it's been a while. It's 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 always hard to say it's been a while for the two of us, but it's not been a while for our listeners because they right, kind of get these weeks. podcasts every other week. Uh, things been going good. It's a little strange though because we were. We really got used to kind of spring temperatures here, and then last night we had a snowstorm, and it's kind of strange. But oh, and well. we're set to have a major blizzard here tomorrow in Denver. It's 60 degrees today, and tomorrow it's supposed to be a huge blizzard. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, well, which means <laughs> the skiing season still goes on, which is good, oh yeah, right? it's extended this year. Yep, it's extended. Yeah. But we're also getting avalanches on the highways. So yeah, that's not <laughs> a good stuff. thing. Yeah. Yep. All right. Anyway. Um, would you would you like to go ahead and uh, introduce today's guest, or I, I would love shall we, to. Shall we banter some more? No, no, I think it's good. Um, so the our guest today, actually, I met her about a half a year ago in Detroit because when she was presenting at Def One, uh, kind of our first version of Def One in the U.S. Uh, her name is Nikki Klein, senior technolo- technical evangelist at Amazon Web Services, and she was really. Um, she was amazing on stage, and uh, there, there's a couple of things that were amazing about her and the reason why we wanted to get her on the show. First of all, the topic she talked about, uh, developing modern serverless applications on AWS, and that was nice. She did a live demo, and it was clearly, it's always a tough thing to do something live on stage. So uh, yeah. kudos kudos for her, or to her for that. But then I think what's also very interesting was kind of how she got into technology and that's actually the story that I want to kind of ask her in the beginning before we talk about serverless, um, hearing a little bit more about Nikki. So first of all, Nikki, hopefully you are there with us. And I'm here. Yeah. Just, I was just quietly listening. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, thanks for joining us today. And Thank you for having me. Yeah, maybe I know you are in New York as we speak, I believe so, right? I am in New York right now. But that's not your usual home, is it? No, I am based in Seattle. All right. And well, you know, for the people that haven't crossed paths with you yet, uh, with your work as an evangelist, uh, can you quickly introduce yourself, what you do right now for AWS and kind of what's your what's your role? Yeah. So I'm a software developer by trade and a developer evangelist, if you're not familiar, um, is just a software engineer that teaches developers how to do things um, like either on AWS or wherever they work, wherever they're they're an evangelist. Um, And specifically, my role is digital. So I'm a digital evangelist. So you'll find me on podcasts, on live streams, um, on YouTube, on Twitch, on Facebook Live, on Stack Overflow. All of our digital channels are where um, the digital streaming evangelists show up. And that's that's where I spend Mm -hmm. most of my time. Cool. I, I had no clue that you actually differentiate between a digital evangelist and, I guess, a regular evangelist. I had no clue, but it makes, I get. Well, so does this mean? And if I if I ask this kind of direct question, does this mean in your job role you actually get, uh, I don't know, rated by the number of blog posts you have and the number of podcasts? Is this kind of how they? I'm not sure if rating is the right term, but is this something that you have in your goals? Yes, yeah, these yeah. are metrics I need to meet. So by being on this podcast, you are helping me meet those <laughs> metrics. Um, yeah, so me streaming um, on Twitch helps drive the metrics that I that my goals, my personal goals are trying to meet. And regional evangelists is what they're called. Their goals are more related to public speaking. Mm-hmm. But you also do public speaking, right? Because I saw you in, in Detroit. Yes. So anytime that I want to do public speaking, because I particularly am in love with an audience or a conference or, um, yeah, I can, I can say yes, but it's really, it doesn't necessarily help me meet my metrics, but it's up to me. Mm -hmm. 
That's, so that's cool. So you get to do all the fun stuff about speaking and presenting and everything all kind of comfortably from maybe from home or whatever, right? But whenever you feel like it, you can go out and speak as opposed to a lot of these other speakers who spend their life on the road. That's correct. That's, that's, uh, pretty, that's one of the benefits awesome. of streaming. That's amazing. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. Hey, so. and do you want to tell us a little bit before, I definitely want to talk about serverless because it is, we we had a couple of people on the show in the last couple of months talking yep. about serverless, but I'm really, I really like kind of your background, um, like how you got into the position where you are right now, what you did before AWS, because I think it's, it's it's nice to hear people's life stories and how they change paths in their career and and how they end up where they end up how they end up in the things that they're passionate about. So maybe you want yeah. to walk us a little bit through that. Uh, absolutely. So I actually had four careers before I became a software engineer. Um, so I dabbled in a lot of different things. I went into the finance industry. I actually worked in hardware for a hot second. Um, and ultimately, I don't know why I did not like see myself in tech like as a career, but I didn't when I first graduated college. And it's weird because I've been obsessed with technology since I was a little kid. I always had the new hot thing. I had to have it. Um, and I always took apart my mom's computer and put it back together again. And I, I would do all kinds of weird things that my parents would look at me and be like, what is she doing right now? Um, so, but I never really thought that I could become an engineer. Uh, and then, uh, I was working in the finance industry, uh, actually at JP Morgan and I was bored out of my mind, like couldn't, <laughs> couldn't stimulate me. If you tried, I would get in at 6am and I would finish all the things I needed to do by 8am. And I would sit there from 8am till 3pm racking my brain for what on earth I could possibly do. I would read every single article online that you could find. I would text every single person on my phone. My mom told me I needed a life. Like it was, it was bad. It was like to a point where I reached like so, so many low levels of boredom. Like my Facebook newsfeed couldn't update fast enough to entertain me. That's like a serious low, by the way. So I was like, okay, what can I possibly do that is a sustainable career that I can do forever? Because my other careers that I had jumped into after college had also bored me, but finance had especially bored me just because I was really efficient and fast and like nothing, there's nothing that really changes. Like things go up and down, like the stock market goes up and down and new companies pop up and arise, but there's nothing really different to learn. Like once you understand the concepts, you understand them and you know how things are going to go for the most part. There's always unexpected, but it's a, it's not like software engineering where I have to learn something new every day. So I sat there and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I thought about when I was a kid, I really loved um, puzzles and I also loved Legos. So I'm like, okay, I need a job that involves building and problem solving because I remember being a kid and sitting in a room for eight hours doing a puzzle and even forgetting to eat. So my, the point where my mom was like, did you eat lunch today? Like, oh, mm-hmm. right. I didn't do that. I would just get so invested in completing the puzzle that I would forget all about everything around me. And so I wanted that kind of uh, focus and excitement in my own career. So I'm like, okay, Google jobs with building and problem solving. Coding naturally came up. So I started coding at my desk at JP Morgan during those, <laughs> you know, six hours where I was doing absolutely nothing. And, uh, and then after four months of coding at my desk, I was like, okay, I have to make this real. Like this needs to be my career because I'm obviously way more invested in this than I am at those two hours I put in every morning. Um, and so then I started looking for like, you know, uh, post back programs and like all kinds of things. And boot camps were not really a thing at that time. So like the word didn't like register to me to Google or look for. Um, and so I looked for all kinds of like post back programs or like how to get a CS degree or how to do this. And one time I did the Google search and the word boot camp came up and I was like, what is this? Looked into it. There was only one available. It was Hack Reactor. Um, and which would required me to move because I lived in LA at the time. And I was like, oh man, I'm gonna have to move to San Francisco and live off my savings to attend this one boot camp. There's gotta be a better way. But I applied naturally. And I had this whole plan of how I was gonna move out. And uh, and then like two weeks later, uh, this boot camp in LA contacted me and they were brand new. And, uh, you know, stupid me didn't ask a single question. They were like, 
do you want to, do you want to be a part of it? I was like, yes. Normal person would probably have asked like, how many success stories have you had? Like, like, what do you teach people? Like what stack am I learning? Like, I didn't ask a single question. I was like, yeah, sign me up. Like, where do I sign? So I, I went to this boot camp and I learned how to code on the weekends, which they don't do anymore at any boot camp I've looked at. Um, and I, le- I worked my 40 hour job at JP Morgan, which was really not 40 hours, but I still had to be there for all 40 mm-hmm. of them. Yeah. And then I did 20 hours of coding at night during the week and 20 hours on the weekend. And I got a job a week after graduation as a .NET developer, um, for which I did for two years uh, before starting my own company. And then I did that for another two years before coming to AWS. Wow. Wow. So coding for a total of five years. uh, But the first year was mostly at my desk at JP Morgan or at home. You know, it's funny. There's a similar a par- a parallel sort of between your path and mine in a, a bit because I was, as I mentioned before we started the show, a communication major. But while you were working at JPMC, I was working at CNBC, reporting <laughs> on all the financial news. I was uh, watching that show every day. <laughs> well, yeah, we always used to joke people only had it on for the ticker, right? Because yep. it was a free ticker. Um, but in a similar way, I, I was I felt like I was in a dead end job. I decided, you know, like this is not what I want to do. And I had a friend working in some startup. This is in 2000 or 2001, I think. Um, and he was making twice my salary. So my impetus was actually just like, well, if I'm going to hate my job, I should get paid more to hate my job. Yeah, I didn't even and- know how much software engineers <laughs> got paid. Like I didn't even do it for money yeah. at all. Like there was no. Was, that's all nothing. I did it for. That's the only reason why I did it because I was like, I'm going to hate my job no matter what because I wanted to be a musician. Um, but then I got into QA and then I quickly got into performance and then everything just started taking off from there. But yeah. I just didn't want to be bored anymore. anymore. That was my ultimate goal was like, I don't really care how much money I make. I just don't want to be bored. Yeah, I'll kill myself if I have to work for, you know, however many years, like the next 40 years and be this bored. Like I can't, I won't survive. Yeah. So it's it's important to uh, to find that breaking point and, and and make a change when you need to. But anyway, um, Andy, you you went straight in, right? You uh, you went to performance right away, or uh, no? To, I was well. I did a, I attended a high school for software engineering, so I finished okay. when I was eighteen. Dang. And then uh, yeah, I knew what I wanted to do in pretty early on. And then I think I, that if like my parents had like known anything about like compute, like my, neither of my parents are in software or computers or technology at all. My dad's a, an attorney and uh, my mom worked in the oil industry and then became a stay at home mom. So like neither one had, you know, the knowledge to direct me towards software engineering. But had somebody known that my interest in computers from a young age would make me a lot of money and be a great career for me, like maybe I would have been like on the path from like age seven, but yeah. nobody, nobody knew to tell me anything. I had to figure yeah. it out. Yeah. Hey, um, I got two questions actually. Um, the first one going back to the boot camp, can you explain that a little more? So you said they don't do this anymore, but, um, was it? Oh, so they still do boot camps, but there okay. is a lot of things about my boot camp when I originally attended that are not done anymore. So for example, if you attend a boot camp in today's world, like right now, you will be investing uh, usually three months of your time in a full-time boot camp, meaning Monday through Friday. So my boot camp was Saturday and Saturdays and Sundays, and it was 10 hours each day. So 10 hours on Saturday, 10 hours on Sunday. And then that's, that's usually not something that you can find where you can do a weekend boot camp. So now modern boot camps will make you commit uh, mm-hmm. to full-time to weekdays. So you have to quit your job and commit to it full-time. Mm-hmm. They don't want any distractions. You know that that's kind of severe. I think I I go back to my cousin who he was a he's a pilot and he wanted to fly you know for the major airlines, and I, I really think that kind of an approach um, that you're describing really fits the airline industry, which is a real huge hurdle for people because for him it was a similar thing. He could wouldn't be able to work. He was going to have to pay I think sixty grand for the course. And then get out and become like a junior pilot for a major airline making 28000 a year, you know. So it, it's one of those situations where with these boot camps, like even the way you're describing it, 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 it gives people a really hard choice. Because how are you supposed to live or pay rent? I guess you have to still be living at home unless you get that weekend option. Which yeah, they don't do anymore, which- it is tough. But there are scholarships, uh, especially for diversity that is interested in tech. Uh, okay. To go to one of these boot camps. Also, if you are a veteran, 
um, there are boot camps on the GI Bill so that when so you get great. back from, yeah, yeah. So there's there are ways to attend a boot camp without um, being completely put out. But yeah, if you're uh, if you don't meet any of those categories, you might have to live off of your parents or have a nighttime part time job where you just work nights. Yeah. Um, but it would be very difficult. I agree. Hey, then, so the second question, you, you mentioned it, and maybe you wanted to talk more about it, but you said after the boot camp, you basically, you started your own startup, right? Yeah, so I worked as an engineer for two years, and then I started a company, um, and my company actually started out of a hackathon, so I won a pretty large hackathon in San Francisco, uh, where I won a quarter of a million dollars um, wow. in investment in the, in the idea, um, and it was called Beta Gig, um, so... Beta gig is named after exactly what it does. So beta test your next gig. It's just a clever way of saying, try out your next job. So obviously I had this really interesting past where I had many different careers before I entered tech. And I would have loved to have been able to try out uh, what it was going to be like before taking a job or entering into a new career. And so the way that beta gig works is that um, instead of grilling someone when you hire them, you actually just bring them on for a day and they like incorporate it into your team and they're job shadowing um, and they can do some work, but whatever work they do, you can't actually use unless uh, you hire them for legal reasons, obviously. But mm -hmm. job shadowing is considered a bona fide education experience. Um, and so it's 100% legal. And then if you liked working with them for the day and they really enjoyed working with you for the day, then you could move them through the hiring process. So you could put them through any other loops that you needed to make sure that they were a good hire. But basically you get to see what it's like to work with them and they get to see what it's like to work with you. Um, and then usually it results in a longer hire and less turnover for both cultural reasons, mm -hmm. um, you know, job fit, career fit, mental fit, all, all the things. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's a great idea. Yeah. Thanks. So, <laughs> So, so, but, but, help me, help me understand. So that means Beta Geek was the platform that you built to provide, like, a platform for companies that wanted to hire people, and like, you, you connected them, yes. or what was the, the platform? So it was like a marketplace platform. So mm -hmm. users would sign up, like job seekers, yeah. and then companies would sign up and offer job shadowing gigs. So let's say that Dev One or uh, Dynatrace was hiring a software engineer mm -hmm. and uh, you would post your software engineering gig and you would set up a job shadowing day and the platform would actually help you arrange for mm -hmm. how to schedule that job shadowing day, like how to create an agenda for the candidate, okay. how to create things that you are, that you're going to get a lot out of and the candidate's going to get a lot of out mm -hmm. of. Um, and then basically similar to the experience of Airbnb, um, the, if you accepted a candidate, so candidates would request to shadow at your company for that gig, you could review, you know, who they are, their resume, their skills. Mm -hmm. um, you could even set up a phone screen initially if you wanted to. And then if you'd like to move forward with the job shadow, you accept the request and then they receive the agenda for the day. And then they get the address and the information and then they show up. Pretty cool. Very and similar I, to like Airbnb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and so I, I would assume now you moved to AWS. That means you you made the company successful and then sold it for for. for no, for, I wish. <laughs> I, uh, I raised one point six million dollars from a VC, and they received a controlling stake in my company. And unfortunately, they shut us down, um, without true cause, in my opinion. But. It, it just was a political nightmare, mostly, and uh, it was very sudden and unexpected. Okay. So a, a life lesson learned, even no, not a pleasant one, but at least a life lesson learned how to deal with with VCs. and uh, <laughs> A lot of life lessons learned. Uh, for sure, I, I don't regret anything I did, but if I were to do it again, I would do a ton of things differently. Mm -hmm. I probably would not have a co-founder. I don't know that I would necessarily raise around um, even immediately. I might do so like much later on in the future. Unfortunately, the conditions that I started the company in forced me to fundraise sooner than maybe I would have mm -hmm. um, if I had stayed at a steady job and kept working while I built the company. But um, once I won the hackathon, um, I was pretty much forced to quit my job. And uh, because I got into an accelerator and I got all this money and they were like, yeah, you got to quit. So mm -hmm. had I started again, I would, you know, keep my job full time and build the company in the evenings or the weekends. 
um, until I felt like it was at a place where it was pretty much taking off and maybe I wouldn't need to fundraise. That's the hope. Mm -hmm. I also probably wouldn't start a marketplace. That is an extremely difficult thing to start, especially for your first company. Um, you have the classic chicken and the egg problem Mm -hmm. and, uh, It, it just creates a lot of a lot of problems and it makes you go a little bit slower than you might have liked or that maybe you would have even with funding. So then did you find the show Silicon Valley cathartic or was it more like reliving a nightmare? Um, I lived that show. Like I would watch an episode and then the next week that thing would happen to me and I'd be like, oh my God, this is like not happening right now. Or vice versa, I'd watch the show and something would happen and the next week the same thing would happen to me and I'd be like, huh, well... Um, let me think back to Silicon Valley. What happened then? What did the what did somebody yeah. do? Like, what was the sol- What was the solution to this problem? Um, so yeah, I definitely lived Silicon Valley. It's a very realistic show. Yeah, well, you know, I, I got to give huge kudos to you because obviously I've never st- started a company. Don't know if I ever will, but that's amazing. That two years after going through that boot camp, you were in that spot already. So. That that's that I alone. Think I whether would or not be there either, it's it's funny. They uh, the boot camp like recorded a video of me saying, you know, at the end of the boot camp, they were like, uh, "Help us record this video for promotion." I'm like, "Sure, no problem." And so they asked me a bunch of questions, like, "How was your experience? What did you learn?" Blah blah blah. And then the last question was like, "Where do you see yourself in the next five years?" And I don't even remember saying this, but I was like, "Oh yeah, in the next five years, I want to start my own company." And then I did it in two and they like sent me back the video. They were like, do you remember saying this? Like, oh my God, no, (laughs) totally forgot. But I didn't have the plan to do it so quickly after it's, it really was uh, the hackathon that kicked it off. And uh, I didn't expect to win that hackathon. (laughs) I don't think anybody expected me to win that hackathon because the audience was definitely almost upset. (laughs) (laughs) So anyway, now that, now that brings you to AWS and your your really cool digital. What, what do you call it? digital evangelist? Digital streaming evangelist or digital, digital evangelist? Either so one. that was that was the next step after uh, beta gig, right? Yeah. So okay. um, luckily, when like the company I, I said ended very suddenly, like I came in on a Friday morning and at ten a.m. I was told I needed to fire everyone and that the company was shutting down. So. Um, I was not even thinking about the next job, but my advisors had my back and they put out all their feelers and pretty much within a week I had every top tech company contacting me, um, for a role. And, uh, I went with AWS. I've used AWS since I became a developer, um, in the very early days and also with serverless. I, um, helped my first company that I worked at just as a developer build, um, like a serverless microservice. And so I was really interested in serverless. And uh, then obviously my next choice was to come to AWS. And and now I'm here a year later. And when did you, at which point did you move from LA up to Seattle? Because you, you obviously moved, moved. Yeah, I moved from LA to Seattle January 5th of 2018. Okay, so it was with the it was basically when you were already working for AWS. Yeah, no, they relocated yeah, me. Yeah, cool. Yeah. yeah. I'm actually moving again. I'm moving to the Bay Area in a month. Oh, why Why then? Is there... Well, um, two of my shows are streamed from the San Francisco office. Um, one is about startups. So I interview uh, startups building on AWS. So my heart obviously still lies with startups. Um, you know, my first company that I worked for was kind of a startup. It was just like a 12 year old startup, but still a smaller company. I like the small feel. And then when I started my company, we were definitely a startup. We were a team of 10. Um, and so my heart very much still lies with the startup community. And so one of my shows, I feature guests uh, from the startup community building on AWS. Mm-hmm. So Brian, that means we need to come up with a great idea, build a startup in order to get on her <laughs> show. <laughs> Well, 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 my idea for a startup is a reliable podcast remote recording <laughs> program because I'm telling you the ones out there are not very reliable. Well, uh, if you build it, uh, I welcome you to come on the show and talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the problem, building yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> the show, uh, it it's uh, streamed from Twitch uh, Tuesdays at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So it actually was just a couple of hours ago. Okay. Yeah, so you go back to back a lot with these then. 
Yeah. Uh, and we're going to put the links to um, your shows, but just uh, for, for people who I think it's pretty simple for the Twitch one, do you just want to mention where, where that is right now? Yeah. So to watch any of my shows on Twitch, you would just go to twitch.tv slash AWS. Um, and I will start streaming on my own channel. I haven't uh, been able to get up the, the setup yet, but that will start soon. And my, the channel is just um, K-N-E-E-K-E-Y-23. So it's just my name as an ORNM. I'm a mm. linguist major, so that's, uh, that's my thing. So it's knee and then key. So you didn't buy uh, Nikki.dev? Um, I didn't. I I thought about it. I, first of all, I would have bought knee key, like the knee, like uh -huh. your knee, and then a key because it's just uh -huh. it's my it's my little organism that I'm obsessed with. Um, but I I thought about it and then I was like, oh, like what is the purpose of this? Like what what would I do with this it's besides like just throw my resume up there or something yeah. basic? <laughs> um, but you know, it's not too late. I could still buy it now. It's probably ridiculously expensive, but yeah. Hey, uh, so anyway, yeah, oh, yeah, go ahead, Eddie. switching gears a little bit. So obviously you have a lot of experience with serverless as you've built serverless microservices with your your first job, basically after boot camp, um, and, and since then been promoting it. If people are, you know, getting our listeners, right? We, I think we have a couple of those, a couple of listeners that are already kind of familiar with serverless and, and maybe built serverless applications, microservices, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but for what can you tell our listeners in when you got started, what were the things you wish you would have known uh, back then when you started? So things like, like you know, the, 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 class, the classical mistakes that, that people should not make when they get started now. All right. Well, the first one you usually run up against um, is IAM permissions, actually. So the thing about AWS is... Um, Developers were not first AWS, right? It was, you know, ops ops people, infrastructure people were first AWS. And I feel like a lot of developers became truly interested in working with AWS when Lambda was first released. And that's actually what piqued my interest in AWS and what has consistently piqued my interest moving forward. Um, and it's because it's just amazing that I can just run something without touching the ops, like, I am not an ops person. I'm a developer. And while I've learned my, you know, basic set of ops skills to do a lot of things like deploy and CI CD, um, I truly love the ability to just write code and not worry about it and run it serverlessly. Um, and so the first thing you run up against is something that if you've never used AWS before, I see a lot of developers run up against it because they just are not familiar with AWS. And that is IAM permissions. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. having an understanding of, IAM roles and how they work and how to give them permissions to execute your Lambda or even give your Lambda role permissions to do something else inside AWS. So typically when you write a Lambda function or a Lambda serverless app, um, you are probably using other services in conjunction with Lambda. So maybe you're hitting Dynamo, you're depositing data in DynamoDB, maybe you're um, putting data in a queue in SQS, um, maybe you're sending out a notification with SNS. You, you could be doing a lot of different things, and you're most likely using it in conjunction with an AWS service. And so you need to make sure that your IAM role that is running your Lambda function not only has permission to execute your Lambda function, but also has permission to do the number of things that you're asking, you're, that you've written the code to do. So maybe mm -hmm. you've used the SDK to deposit something in Dynamo. You need to give the, the IAM role permission to insert something in Dynamo, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that's usually the first thing that I see developers run up against. The next mm -hmm. thing would be timeout. Um, so if you're not familiar with serverless, you definitely should not be writing a serverless function for a process that you need running for like an endless amount of time. Mm -hmm. Like that you should still spin up a server for. Um, the timeout limit is 15 minutes, but when I started developing serverlessly, it was five minutes. Uh, so it was even less time. They, they did up the timeout, but... The concept of the timeout is is more of a, a mental concept than it is anything else. Because if I need a process running for three hours, then I am not going to choose a Lambda function. That is the mm -hmm. wrong way for me to go. And so understanding just that not only do you have a limit to how long your function is going to run for, um, but just from an infrastructure standpoint, ch picking and choosing the things that should run serverlessly to reduce costs um, is a really, really smart move that you can make. 
So if something you only need it to run when basically when something else happens, that is a great use case for Lambda. So when somebody clicks this button, I need X to happen. And only when they click this button, and it is not a three hour running process. It is just a, you know, two minute thing that I need to happen when somebody does X. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a great process for a Lambda. So another great thing that I like to use Lambda for is APIs. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I have a bunch of API endpoints and each endpoint does something specific to data. Maybe it's an insert, an update, uh, a get, Um, Those processes are all definitely under five minutes. And so I definitely am going to use Lambda for my API endpoints. Well, most likely they're under five minutes if you're not running like a super long query to a SQL server database. Mm -hmm. Um, Most likely it's a great use case for serverless. So those are the top two things I see like new developers with serverless run into. Trying to think about what else. Uh, Sometimes memory issues come up so you can change the memory on a Lambda. Um, it's default set to like, what is it? Like, I think I forget the default. I think it's like mm-hmm. 15 megabytes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might be less. But yeah, so if you, it, you'll, you'll see the errors come up in the console, usually when you run into these first few errors and you might not know what they mean if you haven't seen them before. Um, but you, usually those are the first three. And sometimes even I run into them because I forget and I'm like just writing code and I push it and I'm like, what is this error? Oh man, I forgot to add permissions. Um, So it just, it's one of those things that happens even if you've been coding with Lambda for a long time. So, so in terms of the, um, you know, you don't want it to be a long running job uh, and you don't want it to be being invoked so many times that it might be cheaper to just have something up and running all the time for it. But there we've, we've talked to some people and and I kind of want to get your take on this where if it just runs once every now and then, Right, I forget what the keep alive of the lamb the the lambda component is, but you know, first time it runs, it's going to take a little longer to start up and kick cold in. Cold start. Yeah, the cold start. Thank you. Um, what you know, there's a balance between having it up and running and being able to serve people. But if you're running too often, right, you might as well just have something. It might be cheaper to just have a, a container up and running the whole time. Do you have any thoughts on how you figure out that balance? That's a tough balance, but I actually have created serverless applications that I need running the whole Uh time because you can host like an entirely, uh, like for example, I'm going to use .NET. You can host an ASP.NET web application on Lambda. So like when you pull up, you know, a URL, it displays a .NET application. And the first time you load it, you might hit run up against that cold start. But the way to avoid the cold start is to just set a CloudWatch event to re-trigger your Lambda like every five minutes. Um, so that you never run up against that cold start. But obviously, if you have a really long running process and it's very memory intensive and you know that it's going to take this X amount of time that's way longer than a Lambda should be running, then you should definitely just spin up a container. Um, if you also would like to be able to control the host, that is a really good instance when you're going to want to pick a container over serverless because serverless is serverless for that reason. It means I am not touching the host. I am not controlling the host. I'm not setting it up. I'm not patching the host. I'm not doing anything to the host. I'm just giving it some code to run. But if I need to control the host, if I need to install specific things um, that I need to be able to control every ounce of my host, then I'm going to want my own container and I'm going to want to write a Docker file so that I can control every last ounce of it. So really AWS is all about granularity of control. And Mm -hmm. most of the services are either I want a ton of control. I want to control every last ounce of this, or I don't want any control. So serverless is on that other end, which is like, I don't want any control. Like, give me the basic things that I need to select and that's it. And, you know, all the way up to a virtual instance is going to be, I want, you know, that granular level of control. I want to control every single thing down to the last bite. So um, that's really the difference. And I would say when you're picking between containers and serverless, keeping that in mind is probably the biggest factor beyond just, I have a long running process. I don't know how to keep it running without dealing with a cold start. Right. Hey, I, I got two questions here on um, something you said earlier. The first one, coming back to the, the permissions, I assume the permissions, like uh, allowing my Lambda function to, let's say, call the MODB, that's not enforced within the SDK, but it has to be, un- be enforced on a different level because I can either use the SDK or I can just call the REST APIs from the MODB. So I assume it's enforced somewhere else. 
What do you know there? So what do you mean by enforce? So in so if you're using the SDK, so if you wrote a Lambda function mm-hmm. and you are writing code in your SDK to hit Dynamo and mm-hmm. you're you're deploying that to Lambda, your Lambda IAM role has to has have permission to hit Dynamo because the way it works is that once your code gets into Lambda, it pulls the credentials from that IAM role. And so then it's only allowed to do things that the IAM role is allowed to do. And so if the IAM role is not allowed to insert mm-hmm. to Dynamo, or update to Dynamo, then it's going to give you an error message of permission denied. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That makes sense. I was just thinking, I think there's two ways of calling, let's say, DynamoDB. I could either use the SDK, or I could, and maybe I'm wrong, but I assume I could also just call uh, the REST endpoints of DynamoDB. Uh, Yeah, no, you absolutely could, but in both cases, the credentials. Yeah, you're right. So you don't don't add any credentials, right? When you deploy your code, Mm -hmm. so if you're testing serverless code, you need local credentials so that locally you could test. But once you deploy it into Lambda, Lambda doesn't need your credentials because Lambda already has them, right? It's already in the cloud. And it's basically pulling the IAM role to say what permissions those credentials have. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're hitting the API endpoint or using the SDK, which is essentially the The same same thing, thing, just one that's easier, uh, you still need to have permissions on that role to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Uh, Another thing, and and I'm not sure, I think we had somebody on the show a a while ago. He was a consultant and has built serverless applications in the past. And I think he he brought up an interesting point in terms of cost, because we always say that uh, lambdas are you know, fairly cheap per invocation. But then he said, if you're exposing lambda endpoints to the outside world through the API gateway, then obviously you have to pay for the API gateway as well. And he brought up a point saying that uh, you know the API gateway, I don't know, is, is X times more expensive than, than lambda. And therefore, per lambda execution, you have to factor in the additional cost of the API gateway. And then he said, you know, they have models where they actually calculate at each particular point, is it more, is it cheaper to take all your Lambda logic and actually put it into a container and then just expose that um, to the outside world versus going via the API gateway. So my question to you uh, is, is this still accurate? Is the API gateway still, let's say, a, a cost component we really have to look into when exposing serverless to the outside yeah. world? So if you need your Lambda to be exposed to the outside world, um, there are two ways to do it. You could use API Gateway. You could also use um, Elastic Load Balancer, ALB now, Mm -hmm. to hit Lambdas. So if you have an ALB, or no, sorry, I said EL, I said Elastic Load Balancer, Uh, but what I really meant is Application Load Balancer. Uh, ALB, yeah. So if you have an ALB, you can now use it to uh, hit your Lambda as of reInvent last year. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that might actually be different pricing. What I do know about the free tier, though, is that Lambda is you get 1 million free requests per month eternally, like indefinitely, like till the end of time. Like there's no uh, the free tier for that does not end ever. So it doesn't matter how long you've had your account. Um, So let's say you had a website that was hosted on Lambda. You would pretty much only be paying for your API gateway usage mm-hmm. if your website was hit less than a million times a month. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Cool. Um, last question that I have is nothing to something you said earlier, but just in general, because we are talking with our customers a lot about doing blue-green deployments, canary releases, um, you know, then you know, testing obviously their code in CI C D and then using automated quality gates uh to let's say stop the promotion of a container into the next phase in case we see, you know, bad performance behavior for instance. How would, how does this work with Lambda? What are the best practices there uh in terms of you know of pushing it through different stages in terms of blue green deployments or canary? Is there any best practices around that? Yeah, so Lambdas have versions. Um, so most likely what you, I mean, I'm not actually familiar with how you would do this. Let me just preface mm-hmm. by saying that. And I'm sure that there's a ton of people on the internet that have an opinion one way or the other. Um, but what I would do if I was doing this is I would um, deploy a new version of my Lambda and then I wouldn't let it go live um, until I tested it mm-hmm. uh, using any number of testing tools. And then I would basically set the newest version to go green. 
Um, that's probably how I would do it. And you can update versions of Lambda layers as well as Lambda functions and only send that version to be the one that's displayed. Okay, so you just brought up Lambda layers. I think that's also a new, a rather Lambda new Lambda layers is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is something new. Um, if you have not heard of it, it launched at reInvent. Um, so with Lambda layers, you can also bring your own runtimes now. So if we do not support the language that you would like to write your Lambda in, you can now write a runtime in a Lambda layer that you can reuse for all of your Lambdas. So I know that Stackery actually wrote a PHP Lambda layer. Um, and so now if you wanted to write a Lambda function in PHP, you could actually just reuse their layer, they've made it public. They just hand out the ARN, the Amazon resource name, on their GitHub. And all you have to do is drop in that ARN um, when you say add a layer in the Lambda console. It's a very, very easy uh, GUI. And then you've added that layer, and then you can now write a Lambda function in PHP. Um, but another use case for layers would be for libraries. Um, so you have a, if you have a custom library that you're creating that you want to use on all of your Lambdas, you can create a layer for it, and now you can reuse code. So the best way to think about layers is just like um, reusable building blocks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, that's funny, Andy. That reminds me of <clears throat> I think it was the same person we were speaking with uh, w about the um, API endpoints, where they've seen people kind of go to an extreme with uh, Lambda, where they're basically recreating every single JVM function or every single Java function. Mm -hmm. In a Lambda where, you know, this is kind of, was kind of humorous, Nikki, where it was all of those built-in functions of, of Java were being created as Lambdas instead of just saying, hey, let's go back what, and, and use the actual JVM because we need all these components anyway. Oh, it was just so, you know, so some people went overboard because they wanted to do Lambda. It sounds like you could obviously get into that kind of trouble with this, but it, it also is, just seems like it's, if I try to understand this, it's, just basically reusable functions that you can share. Is that kind of a yeah. very simple way of saying Yeah, and we also support Java, so you wouldn't actually need to do that because um, we, yeah. will, we will run the JVM. So, uh, yeah, but, but layers are a really, really neat thing. Like if you haven't checked them out and you've been in the serverless world for a while, I highly suggest you check out layers. Um, it's really, really great for libraries, um, custom libraries, even other libraries that you're like, I'm going to use this library on every single function I write you know, for the next 10 functions. And so then you can just write one layer and install that layer on every single Lambda that you write. So you, you can reuse your own code. You can reuse other code. So if somebody else wrote a layer and you already need that exact same piece of code and they made that layer public, like Stackery, for example, um, you can just use their layer. You can take their ARN if they're handing it out and uh, just basically add that layer. I think there's also a GitHub that was made um, so my, my one probably like complaint for, about layers would be that there's no one place to find all the public layers that people have created mm -hmm. um, because right. obviously sharing code is just, that's what we do. We, that's what the developer community does. We just share code. Who wants to reinvent the wheel 17 million times? Definitely not me. Um, so there's not one place where you can go and find all the public layers right now. I'm hoping that there will be soon, but there is a GitHub called Awesome Lambda Layers. I think that's what it's called. And it lists all the layers that are public with the, Amazon resource name, so you can just pull any one of them and drop it into your Lambda console. Pretty cool. I think we are awesome. our Dynatrace uh, agent team for Lambda monitoring. I think they also consider layers in order for us to get our agent in there, um, because we have different. We we had Lambda monitoring for a while, and and I think we proposed different options on how to get our agent injected into your Lambda code, and I think layers is something we're now looking into already, maybe have done it. So that's pretty cool. Awesome. It's definitely really cool. Yeah. Hey, um, I have, I still have one more question on the, the whole CI, CD, because you mentioned this earlier. If I start from scratch with a new Lambda function that I'm going to use for my, for my, you know, I don't know angle apps, and it just does some, some, some business logic. What's the, what's your proposed pipeline how does a pipeline look like for you when building Lambda functions that are exposed to the outside world? So what, 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 what kind of phases does a pipeline entail? What type of tests do you run? And uh, just out of curiosity. Yeah, I would probably use AWS code build just because mm -hmm. I'm going to use AWS mm -hmm. anything. 
Um, but there are plenty of other, um, you know, build tools that you could use like Jenkins. Um, but my tests, uh, they'd probably be pretty basic. I'm not a huge fan of writing unit tests. And mostly the code I write these days is demo code or, um, you know, how to do something really quickly. Um, it's less production code. But if I were writing production code, I would obviously have my code in GitHub. And then I would have a code build project that gets the source code from GitHub and then uh, there would be a SAM template included in that repository. And then basically that would be the deployment configuration for code build to be able to deploy that Lambda uh, to production. So if you've not heard of AWS SAM and you just started writing serverless applications or you've been doing it for a while, I highly suggest you to take a look at SAM. Uh, SAM stands for the serverless application model, and it is essentially an an extension of CloudFormation. And if you've never heard of CloudFormation, CloudFormation is just infrastructure as code. So imagine your Amazon Web Services resources written out as a big JSON object or YAML file. So, you, you know, in the console, you set a bunch of properties that you want. So in the JSON file, you list out those properties as key value pairs. Um, and SAM is an extension of that. And so it is a specific JSON object that you can write for serverless applications. It is expecting you know, certain things like API gateway, if you're going to set up an endpoint, it's basically the parts of cloud formation that you would have wanted for your serverless application, um, because we pretty much know which services you're going to use in conjunction with Lambda. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really easy to set up a serverless application using SAM. And there's another part of SAM that's not just the template, it is the CLI. And so I would use the CLI to actually deploy. Um, and so I can tell AWS code build, I can give it commands, you know, in a build file, um, you know, Ada or SAM deploy. Basically, I can write a SAM deploy statement and I can actually use SAM CLI to run my code locally. So before I even test it, I can do SAM local start API or invoke function, depending on what it is that I'm invoking. Um, and I can give it, you know, an object if I needed to give it an event. I can do a whole host of things with the SAM CLI. Uh, locally and also in code build if I'm ready to deploy. And then once I do that with SAM, it basically is just going to pull that template and um, provision those resources or update those resources if I'm redeploying. And that's basically it. That's essentially what I would do. Um, so I would just use GitHub and code build and SAM. Pretty cool. Awesome. Um, Nick, is there anything else that we missed? I think we talked about your career in the beginning, which was very cool and very enlightening on kind of the paths yeah. you took. And then about, so is there anything missing on serverless or anything you want to add on the career path that we may have missed? I guess what I would say with serverless, if you are listening and you haven't built a serverless application before, um, I do a really cool show with my colleague AM called Build with AM and Nikki. And we have basically built a uh, two serverless applications at this point live on Twitch. And then the uh, the VODs are available on YouTube and our site afterwards. So if you go to aws.amazon.com slash Twitch, um, you can find the show there with all the links uh, to watch any of the episodes. Most recently, we have been building a mobile application in React Native with a serverless backend, backend in Node. Um, so that's probably relevant to a lot of audiences, I hope. And then previously, we we uh, we built a .NET serverless application um, in the in the first season with also with a container as well, a .NET container. Um, so that was a little bit of containers and serverless for you. And then I'm also working on a, a serverless Twitch extension. So if you're not familiar with Twitch extensions, if you watch Twitch frequently, uh, Twitch extensions allow you to interact with um, Either the player, the the hoster, the broadcaster, uh, they they let you, you do a lot of different things on Twitch, and you can build one um, with a backend. And obviously, I I always choose serverless, so I'm currently building one with a serverless backend. And that show is live on Wednesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific time on Twitch.tv slash AWS. That's really cool. Live coding. Live coding. <laughs> Never, I do it all the who, time. Who, yeah, who, I who would have thought, right? Those. <laughs> live coding is an art. Like, there's actually a way to perfect how you live code. Yeah. Well, we, we yeah. we're seeing more people do that, right, Andy? In some of the presentations, I know. Um, oh, who's who's the guy from uh, Pivotal? Um, 
Josh Long. What's his name? Yeah, he loves to do actual live coding during his presentation, his live presentations, which what can go wrong? Um, like eight million things. <laughs> right. So it's kind of fun and exciting to see the live coding going on. Uh, also because, you know, the one thing I, I love to point out is, you know, you, you, you see, you know, as someone who might be a developer or who's learning, you see the experts up there live coding, right? And, you know, I'll use, I'm not a big fan of the word expert, but it's, that's how you feel like you're watching these pros do the live coding and then something goes wrong and you're like, oh wait, it happens to everybody, right? Yep. So it's, it's really cool uh, from that point of view as I well. I love pair programming with my audience too. It's uh, it's really fun to get like the audience really involved. And in. so like, I think the art to live coding is finding the balance between real life coding where you run into like a hundred roadblocks and then like yeah. robotic coding where you run into no roadblocks. Um, so like somewhere in the middle there. So when you, like, if you, if you go through it one time, you might've seen some other roadblocks and you might only hit two or three the next time you go through the same activity. And that's mm-hmm. like the exact amount of roadblocks that the audience is like, Hey, try this. Hey, try this. And they're really invested and really involved. Um, but if you hit too many roadblocks, the way you would do it is if you first time were coding something, then they get really uninterested after a while. Yeah. All right. Um, Andy, did you want to, um, shall we summon the submariner or is there anything else you want no, to do? I think we should. Yeah. Come on, do it. All right. Well, uh, Nikki, thank you so much for being on the show today. And it's been, it's been quite fascinating to hear your story from being completely bored uh, in, with a financial institution and therefore on the side. I think I, I wrote it down correctly. Hopefully, code naturally is what you found and then started uh, getting into coding, then thanks to the boot camp in LA, getting you to work for an organization, writing your first Lambda functions, then winning a 250K uh, pot at a hackathon, and which allowed you then to start uh, Better Geek, which um, and obviously didn't turn out quite the way you wanted it, but still uh, life lessons learned, which ultimately then brought you over these many, many steps uh, to. Uh, the job you have right now at AWS, uh, where you're promoting um, AWS serverless as a digital evangelist, also is something that I learned new, uh, what that is, the difference to a regular evangelist. Now, what I can say on the serverless side, I really like the things you brought up because I asked you things I wish I would have known uh, in case I would start with serverless from scratch. Uh, definitely the IEM permissions, people have to figure out what the whole permissions are all about, especially when you come kind of afresh as a developer into a world that was initial, initially intended for more operations folks and where security and permissions are uh, obviously a, a big thing. So try to get into I and try to get into and understand IEM permissions. I also like when you talked about the timeouts. Not every lambda, not every everything that you think should be a lambda function might be suitable for a lambda function. Um, you, uh, I think you meant you mentioned you said something like um, the the timeout is more like a mindset, but still you need to break down things into smaller pieces. And if it cannot be broken down into a smaller piece, then lambda is just not the right thing. And uh, there's obviously a lot of great content you have out there. Uh, so check out your shows on Twitch. Uh, if you want to see some live coding, uh, your show with, uh, I think it's called Build with AM and Nikki. And uh, we'll post all the links also on the podcast uh, summary page so people can definitely find it. And it was just enlightening and, and inspiring to hear um, that you always knew that you want to do probably something with technology once you started uh, this disassembling and then reassembling the computer of your mom until years later you actually got into engineering um, and then now you are teaching others how to build cool stuff. And uh, I think that's inspiring. And uh, hopefully our paths cross uh, again in the future, maybe at Def One, at another you know version of Def One or at the uh, conference like the Lakeside Head Hack Fest that I want to forward to you. That could also be a great opportunity. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me today. It's been a lot of fun. A lot of topics we covered. Yeah, This is my job. Excellent. And uh, yeah, that's it, I guess. Um, so thank you. And one thing, Andy, uh, obviously, I think this uh, this digital evangelist might work out for you better in the future once you start getting tired of traveling. <laughs> so they're, uh, they're hiring another one right now, actually. Oh. No, no, you can't take Andy from us. Oh, I, just mean, I didn't say he'll, that. Delete. He'll have, to, <laughs> he'll have to start it for, for, for Dynatrace. Yeah. 
Um, so that's awesome. That's a really awesome uh, gig you have there. Yeah. Uh, thank you for coming on the show, and um, thanks for sharing the information. Um, if anybody else has any questions or comments, you can reach us at pure underscore DT on Twitter, or you can send an old-fashioned email to pureperformance at dynatrace.com. We'd love to hear from you, especially if you uh, have any stories and you want to be a guest on the show. And I guess from from me and from Dynatrace, thank you. And uh, thank you, Nikki. Andy. Thank you guys so much. Uh, my Twitter, by the way, is just Nikki underscore 23. You can also reach out to me if you have serverless questions. Happy to help. Awesome. Thank you very much. Bye.